Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. Welcome to the show, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. Good to see you, Gina Grad. Good to see you. And Bald Brian. Yes. And Christy is there as well. Bald's a beautiful wife. Uh, because no. we're going to give a little uh, update on uh, on Brian's health. Um, you well, I'll let you. I'll let you take it. You tell us all about it. Thank you. Hold on, let me put on gallery view here. Yeah, unexpected uh, update today because uh, you had mentioned out of the blue, which is very random on Monday, like, hey, how about a health update? I'm like, well, I'm getting an MRI today and uh, I'm getting uh, results on Wednesday, which is today as we record this. So let's uh, table that because we can um, give a fuller picture at that point. At this point, we be guessing. So I got an MRI today uh, in person, went to Cedar sinai with Christy and uh, met with our doctor for the first time in person in a few months. And um, he, so uh, backing up a couple of steps. So in January of this year, um, he saw something on an MRI at a regular scheduled MRI and he saw like a shadow right on the MRI, nothing significant, but significant enough to be like, you know what? He's aggressive. I want to make sure that we do the right thing at the right time. So he actually put me on low dose uh, Temidar, which is chemotherapy, the same chemotherapy I had 10 years ago. All right. So, so let, I, let, let's just stop for one second. Just set the table uh, very briefly. You know, the tumor is 10 years old now. Uh, I was diagnosed in April of 09. So just tur- my tumor just turned 11. Oh, 11. Birthday. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, happy right. birthday. Um, the, the, obviously, the last of Bob Ryan was the 10 year anniversary of that. So, yeah, 11 years uh, past diagnosis. Um, initially had radiation and chemotherapy, the, the aforementioned Temidar. And um, that was really rough. As you guys remember, I was on a walker. You remember my speech. Mm-hmm. It, was, it, was a, it was a dark time. Um, made a big comeback uh, shortly after that on uh, Avastin, which was, you know, came at just the right time. Um, and it's been 10 years of, I would say, smooth sailing, but it's never smooth sailing when you have brain tumor. You know, there's, there's blips here and there, but more or less, you know, I'm here. We have the baby and the daughter and all that stuff. So uh, 10 years of um, relatively calm waters. Mm-hmm. Um, and so January of this year of 2020, going for regularly scheduled MRI, Dr. sees uh, what I guess you would describe as a shadow. The he, flare. Of, yeah, he's just like, you know, I don't like the looks of this. Um, I, just to be safe and proactive and, and get ahead of this thing, I'm going to put you on a low dose of that chemotherapy that you were on 10 years ago. And so from January to now, I've been on um, Temidar. I've been on chemo. Uh, and does that mean like intravenously or a tablet? Or- Thankfully, it's an oral uh, pill that I take at night, um, but it leaves me extremely fatigued, which is funny because during this whole COVID thing, number one, I'm, I, have, I haven't really told anyone aside from Christy and uh, that's more or less it. Um, uh, and so I've been at a really high risk, you know what I mean? So I've, I've been trying sure. to sort of like on the low, on the, on the low key, stay away from crowds and, you know, anything, anything could be considered high risk. Okay. Drama queen. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, uh, where was I going with this? The, ke- the, the chemo. They had a yeah, flare up. up. Oh yeah. So, so at the time, so January, so Christy goes to him, he's like, how, how worried are you? Like, should we be freaked out or worried? And he's like, like yeah, out of ten, well, where are you? It's like I'm, I'm like at a four out of ten. And I was like, okay, well, we're concerned, but we're not alarmed, obviously. And um, then I had, I've had MRIs every month for the last six months, and they've all come back stable, more or less the same, um, which is obviously really good news uh, when you're dealing with a tumor that may be growing. And so um, we go for today for a, we go in this morning for a uh, MRI results, and he looked at it and he's like, well. I, I do see some changes and he points out these two little and he even admitted he's like, these are tiny, but still two tiny little dots where they shouldn't be two tiny little dots. And um, what else? Uh, oh yeah. A little thickening, thickening uh, of the actual like tumor area. But it means brighter on the scan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not growing per se. It's not, it's not going like this. It's just getting more, you know, darker on the scan because they give be contrast, right? When mm-hmm. they do the MRI. It's like a light bulb. If it was like trying to warm up, like mm-hmm. it's it's like trying to warm okay. up before it's getting to like full speed capacity. You're just not seeing it expanding. And so he says to us this morning, he's like, same thing. I want to be aggressive. I want to be proactive. I want to get ahead of this thing. I, I want to do things now before it's too late. So he's like, I'm, you know, I recommended three different 
courses of treatment, uh, one of which is going back on Avastin, which I've been off for two years, um, and we're kind of leaning in that direction. So this is all very new. We just had the doctor's appointment four hours ago. So uh, yeah. you guys are kind of the first to, to know. Are there side effects of Avastin? There are, luckily, very luckily, I not only have minimal side effects from Avastin, I also <laughs> respond really well to it. Right. You know, they put me in that category of super responders, keep saying. So um, I'm optimistic. He's optimistic. Uh, this is something of, you know, this is not the worst. This is not great news, but this is not the worst news. And um, yeah, it came as a shock, obviously, but we're, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. How about you? I mean, I'm terrified if I'm being honest, but yeah, always optimistic just in the, the context of everything and the ex experience at the hospital this morning just amidst COVID was wild. Um, but always optimistic, right? Mm -hmm. Like 10 years ago, there was one experimental treatment called Avastin. It wasn't even approved and you got on it. And mm -hmm. now there's, here's three courses of treat treatment. If one doesn't work, we'll try the next one. But the issue is trying to get insurance to approve it. No, oh, they've so, already rejected our yeah, first they, appeal, our, our first uh, attempt. Yeah, within really? an hour of putting it <laughs> in, they rejected ago. it. <laughs> what do they base that on, or what do they God, say? No. As 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 our doctor says, it's based on the whims of the insurance company. Like, it, there's, it sounds insane, and Drew could probably tell you a lot more about this, but it is it is uh, how they're feeling that day. Like the whims of the agent that you talk to. It's right. Insane. Yeah, because if at some point everything is new nothing is carved in stone. It's not a kind of a, you know, their jobs. If you lay carpet, you want to know how many square feet this carpet is nine bucks a square foot installed. And then you just give them a number, but insurance right. is a lot of people going, I don't know. Right. How, well, how bad is it? He's been good for 10 years. You know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. With yeah. Uh, obviously with an eye toward not giving you any money. <laughs> so sadly <laughs> yeah. that's the way they're, they're leaning. But, um, so the idea, the best thing, because it's inoperable, and that'll be mm -hmm. another question I'll ask, which is technology moves along in that department as well. May it ever be operable? That's something we'll sit on for a second. Mm -hmm. That's a um, good question. I don't know the answer to that. We didn't ask the... I, I know that a biopsy is possible if it was necessary. It's a high risk. It's yeah. like 10% high risk. I don't know the, the fancy medical terms that Dr. Rudnick used this morning, but he was like, based on where it is in the brain, we don't have any like biological evidence of the type of tumor that it is. Oh, no, there's no pathology. They can't pathology, tell exactly yeah. what the, you know. Yeah, because one of the options was immunotherapy, which they basically will not cover with insurance. And so that might bankrupt us. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to look at a different option. last resort. Well, yeah. we can have a, you know, we can start a GoFundMe page. Obviously, no, I wet no, my no, wet, thank you. I wet my beak. Obviously, it's not all. It's not all going in your pocket. Um, so, ten years, uh, almost eleven. Oh, past eleven, right? Past eleven. Past eleven mm, yeah. years. And the idea is, no news is good news. It's it's no movement. It it's a tumor. It can't be operated on, so it has to stop. And if it grows or changes, that's bad news. And so yeah. mm -hmm. it's been essentially not changing for numbers of years, I'm, I'm guessing. A decade at least, yeah. A mm -hmm. and, and now it's changing, not necessarily growing, but the idea that there's change or, or movement is, is the non-good news of this part of this discussion, right? That's a very accurate takeaway. Yeah. Yes. Any, any, any difference, any change, excuse me, in the, in the, um, scans he takes is like, Oh, got to take a look at this. He was basically right. like the tumor. It looks like it might start to be waking up. Sorry, I'm hearing myself, but waking up waking and up. we want to stop it before it like takes a big stretch. Right. Wow. And, uh, thank God there's these well, the doctors and thank God there's the materials and the, the medicines and, yeah. mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then, so like, what would it cost? Like if the insurance company doesn't cover, uh, something you'd like a direction you'd like to go, uh, the pharmaceutical direction. We haven't, even, it, God, like no. I said, it's been four hours since we saw the doctor. Uh, I have not even, we haven't even 
we're going to cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we'll never come to it because hopefully that, that option is, you know, in third place, you know, yeah. behind, uh, the, the other two options are to go back on a vast in which I was doing for 10 years quite well, as you can imagine, uh, or doing a sort of newer modified a that, that is not infused, but is in fact, uh, oral. So you could take oh, wow. it like a vast in pill form at home, which would be a super convenient. Wow. <laughs> The, or 10 years ago, or I guess eight years ago, when you were on Avasta and you were doing twice monthly infusions, each of those bills were $55,000 in infusion. And they tapered me off over the... $55,000 yeah. in infusion for like an hour and a half. Per uh. infusion. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, but the insurance paid for that, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and they most likely will again. I don't want to alarm people and think that we're, you know, crying poor and all that. So that, that's, no, not, God, that's no. not what this is about. We're, we're hopefully when that bridge first bridge comes, it's one that insurance. Well, yeah. I, I now have a lot of experience dealing with um, insurance appeals. And mm -hmm. my favorite go-to phrase is, I'm sorry, I just don't accept that. Yeah. So <laughs> right. they cannot get I'll me. Have to remember that. So get that drop, you know, Chris. Get that I am, drop. I am so used to doing this. I am happy to do it again. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Yeah. I think it's the insane. bigger point is like something he's been on before that's mm -hmm. been proven and widespread for the past 10 years, like they'll approve fairly quickly, maybe yeah. three or four days in. The second option is the Avastin, like take home pill. It's not Avastin. It's like, God knows it's what it's newer, called. We have yeah. no idea what it's called. Right. That's going to take more time. That's what well, they already rejected. And immunotherapy, they like won't cover. it's convenient for you. And so, I mean, like, yeah, why would they do something that actually helps you and is convenient? Yeah. Amen. What, so what is the next visit? What's the next MRI? The, weirdly enough, they they set me up with a phone visit. I think it's temporary. I think it's temporary. Mm -hmm. I think what's going to happen the next domino to fall is we'll see if we can get insurance to cover um, what we want it to cover. And we'll go from there in terms of, you know, what option seems best for us. Um, and then I, uh, Dr. Rudnick specifically mentioned he wants to do an MRI one month after we start therapy. So we'll have an idea if maybe it's working or if things are holding steady or what, you know, who knows at that point. Mm -hmm. Do you have any physical feelings, any sensations or anything that feels differently? Sometimes that's it's hard that, to tell. That's the weird part. You remember 10 years, 11 years ago when mm -hmm. I was diagnosed, I was in bad shape. I was, you know, dragging my foot. I was having speech problems. It was very obvious. I had numbness in my face. It was very obvious that there was something going on uh, up there. I don't have any of that this time. I, I, I hope, I mean, aside from maybe my computer dragging a little bit, hopefully I sound more or less the same. Uh, I don't have any speech issues. Um, I'm, I'm much more tired. Mm -hmm. And I'm much weaker than I was, but I've also not been to physical therapy in two months. And I've been on fucking chemotherapy for six months. You know what I mean? When, when are they talking about restarting uh, physical therapy and those sorts of protocols? <laughs> I went yesterday for the first time in two and three months. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm yeah. Glad. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm committed to, you know, my, remember my new year's resolution was put on five pounds of muscle. Obviously that's not happening at this point, but that's still a goal. So i um, trying to get back to normal as fast as possible. Uh, Christy, I should give Christy a uh, plug, but I'm trying to look at what happened to our plugs on my screen. Here. Uh, go oh, you fund me a slash no, 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 stop. That's not funny. I have it. What? I have it on a piece of paper. No, don't. Yeah. You should have her plugs on a paper out there. I should. I agree with you when you say <laughs> I should have Here. her plugs on a piece of paper. <laughs> no, it's there. fine. I'm, I'm one hundred percent with you, you in the I should it's, have it. The question is. It's been a tough. It's been a tough week for all of us, but Christy, Christy especially, because you know, obviously, the riots and the protests and the everything, the COVID and the fucking this and that. Yesterday, our company went through um, layoffs. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Okay. Went it's in the press. So I went through layoffs, layoffs so. yesterday and. I, I just thankfully her she, she still has a I'm job fine. thankfully but uh but, she cut, had, but had awesome for it's just been an, oh well <laughs> we'll make it through this uh thanks chrissy pardon my crumbs by the way on twitter and instagram as well <laughs> Thanks, and on a piece of paper somewhere in this building, theoretically, <laughs> not, not in the studio. And, live and commercial kitchen. grade, commercial grade, the podcast. Oh, commercial thank grade, you. the podcast as well. Right, have probably, fun. Thank you, Chrissy. Godspeed. Should be on that paper as well. All right. Uh, let's see. So um, uh, not good news, but not horrible news, just different news and cause for I don't, I mean, some concern, but it's also just sort of cause to be vigil, right? To go like, okay, yeah. we have to kind of keep an eye now and, and I'm going to do this protocol and that protocol, right? 
and and take action, you know what I mean, as fast as possible. This is the kind of thing where it's like, oh, we got our first sign that things may be going sideways. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but it does. it's not prudent to wait. Well, I'm so glad you don't have a wait and see doctor. That would be uh, everything. Yeah. yeah bad There's plenty of those. Yeah. All right. So you'll keep us, uh, you'll keep us updated on that. Uh, and thanks Absolutely. for that update. All right. Thank you for giving me the time. Now I got the papers in here. All right. Let's see. <laughs> get the papers. Get the papers. Uh, this is a, all right. Anyway, so it's a <laughs> weird, we do seem to be kind of jammed for time around here a lot, except for everyone's sitting in the building for a couple hours before the show starts. I never get that like jammed at the end feeling. There's only one of us that's pressed for time around here. <laughs> I'll blame Caleb. <laughs> All yeah, right. Uh, let's see. So um, I had some thoughts, and uh, let's look down at my what's my stuff. So I wanted those. Uh, I've been I've been obsessed with uh, Dr. Uh, Barbara Ferrer because uh, I believe that she's lying to us and I don't believe she's the right person to be heading up uh, or at least the tip of the spear of when we're coming back or when things are opening or what the plan is. She sees incompetent to me, but she's, she's a PhD. She has a PhD in social welfare, but as the more I think about her saying, look, here's what I'm worried about. I'm worried. Number one about the beaches, number two about the boardwalks and number three about peaceful protests. And I'm like, why are you bringing up the beaches? And I know I've brought this up before, but I'm saying it's like, why as the person who knows what's going on is consulting with a bevy of experts and then who's going to go out and share the information with us? Why is your number one concern the place that is everyone's least concern where there's no history of spreading of this disease? You know, from what we've learned, it's a lot about nursing homes. It's a lot about subways. It's a lot about cramped apartment buildings. We've learned about obesity. We've learned about vitamin D. We've learned about sunshine. We've learned about pre-existing conditions. We've learned about everything. The one thing we've learned from the beach is it's a nothing burger. There's just nothing there. It could help. It could help. That's all we that's mm -hmm. all we don't have. We had a big Daytona spring break party situation going three months ago. Everyone said those people are killing themselves. Nothing came of that. We had another big Ozark pool party. Those guys were killing themselves. Nothing came of that. Why is she starting with the beach? Why, why is that part of her repertoire? Like, I, I need to go out and share information. So there's a scared public out there. The economy's in the, in the tank. We've been shut down for three months. I'm going to get out there and share my information with these people. And she starts with her concerns, which is fine. But she doesn't say anything about nursing homes or public transportation or elevators. She starts with the beach. My only, my only guess, and this is not a good reason, my only guess is that it's summertime, it's getting hot, people want to go to the beach, like people are, are intending to go, they'd like to go, and so her first thought is, but I know where your head's at, don't go to the beach. Is that possible? Well, it's but possible, but there's, explain... but there's no danger from the beach. I, yeah. I agree, I'll I think it's not a good reason, I, I think I, that's, I, why she, that's why she says it. You have that it's clip, Max Zapata? No. The beach thing, the one I was telling you to get oh, three hours ago. Yeah, we have that. Okay, it's not on my screen, by the way. But uh, I, I just, I just, I just want to drill down on it for a second. Go ahead. Obviously, you know, when I look and I see people on the beach that are really close together without face coverings, or people on a boardwalk that All are right. really close together All without. Right. So face she's concerned. She's concerned about the beach. I don't think she's concerned about the beach. If she's concerned about the beach, she should be fucking shit canned this afternoon. She's not an expert. She should not be concerned about the beach. Nobody's concerned about the beach. I talked to uh, Mike August. He went out for his anniversary last night. He was like in Hermosa or Redondo or something. It's like there's fucking people all over the place. They're all over the beach. The place never really shut down and people have always been there. Her concern isn't the beach. Now, her concern, Max Pat, I'm not sure why you didn't pull the beach clip for me when we talked about a couple hours back about pulling the beach clip. Uh, all right, this will work. This is. I don't want to spend my remaining time on Earth listening to you guys fight. <laughs> okay. Is this not the beach clip? This is, but we're 
All right. I have on my screen homeless population. Oh. I have 147 deaths. I have, she's worried about the surge. I don't have anything about the beach. Well, these, because we've played the beach clip. These are clips you I, you may not have seen. So I'm just letting you know we also have this as well. Uh, okay. All right. Well, always just put whatever I asked for on there. So it'll clear, clear that up. Okay. All right. So why, you can get rid of her, but why is she worried about <laughs> the beach? I, she's not worried about the beach. Um, I think what she's doing is, and I think what we're in in California, and especially Los Angeles, I think we're trying to build a fucking time machine to make a bunch of people who are wrong right. I think the beach should have never been closed down, but no one wants to eat it on that. So we keep talking about like as if there's something there. There's no there there. You were wrong. You made a bad decision. It was a bad call. It was irresponsible. You should have focused on nursing homes and elevators and public transportation. You went for the fucking beach. Nothing's happened at the beach. And we don't need to start press conferences with you talking about concern about the beach. That's you concerned for your boss's ass. That's not you being concerned about the beach. That's you making yourself right through a very slow process of, well, we'll wait for the weeks to come out. We don't know what's going on. You know what's going on. Going on, you're wrong. Just say you're wrong and move on. Move the fuck on to the next thing. Open the fucking restaurants. Open the fucking beaches. You're insane, people. You're driving this fucking economy into the ground, and it's all under the auspices of well, we were right about the beach. You're going to retroactively make yourself right about something you're 100 percent wrong about, and it's been months. There's no reason to even talk about it anymore. I told Max Zapata, look up the. Uh, protocol on the beach in LA County. You may swim, you may surf, you may mm -hmm. jog, but you may not lay a towel down. Wet sand, not dry sand. What you guys, what they're doing is they're doing a specific thing as if it exists, as if it, they're, 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 they're building a, a, they're building, they're constructing something that doesn't need to be constructed because it seems like, well, I'm in charge and I have the answers. You have no answers. You have no data. People can lay down on the beach in the sand. People don't get closer than six feet anyway when they lay down on the sand. But you're doing it this way and it, you'll, you'll do it slowly enough so it'll sort of seem like you were right. But you were wrong, and you're just making yourself right by going, okay, now next week we go to phase three. Phase three is, phase three is what? Why are we talking about this? Why isn't everything just open? The rest of the fucking country, half the country's open. I was looking at pictures of a rally, I think, in Boston, that park, Max Zapata. Franklin I, Park. I saw, seemed like tens of thousands of souls all just packed together oh, wow. at the park. That's a, that's, it's a, that's a Patriots, uh, yeah, a Super Bowl party. Right. And, and this thing of like, well, we can't have sporting events anymore. We're going to close down Pebble Beach. There'll be no more Pebble Beach. There'll be no more Quail Lodge. There'll be no more this, no more that. These are throngs of people, just, just piles and piles of people, mostly wearing masks, but not practicing any kind of social distancing at all. They are up in, in each other's grills. Now, Something should happen. We should have news of devastation. Or really what we should be doing is flying over it with crop dusters filled with Purell. And just, if you really meant it, if these people are on a suicide mission now, break it up, man. They shouldn't be allowed to do this. We go to a fucking restaurants like you can eat outdoors. You put the, put the table six foot apart, hang a sheet of Lucite in between your table and that table. Or we can get 100,000 people and go to the park. Well, which is it? What? All right. Now, you want to know why I fucking never believe anything these assholes say. It's because of this. Sorry, go ahead, But what, all, what else doesn't make any sense about this is it's not like I was going to say nobody would blame them. So they, some people would blame them and they'd be right, too. But when when everybody comes out and says this is a new virus, we know nothing about it. We will figure it out as we go. Nobody's going to blame you for getting it wrong. We've already you, we already know nobody has ever seen this before. So if you come out and say we're still learning about this, we thought you could catch it outside. Turns out it doesn't look like you can. So just giving us those facts. Nobody's going to blame you for, quote unquote, getting it wrong. We already know we don't know about it. Modifying your position is never you know, as more information comes in, especially in a situation like this. No one's no, one's, no reasonable part. No reasonable person would be like, how dare you? There there already exist 
2,000 hours of every politician from every side of the aisle saying the wrong thing. It all exists. Right. No one's going to hold you to it. We have tons of Trump saying the wrong thing. We have Fauci on like Anderson Cooper in March saying, well, you don't need masks. This thing's going to be it's going to be the flu, but it's not going to be bad. Like we have everyone saying everything wrong already. Right. Oh, fine. It's like it's like we're all the Kardashians and we got a bootleg porn and it's up on the Internet. So le- we don't need to be so worried about wearing a towel outside the shower. You know, we, <laughs> you can see my dingling. It's up on the Internet. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it, every politician ha- has been right a little bit and wrong a lot. They all made the wrong choices. They right. didn't focus on the nursing homes. They focused on locking down. Maybe locking down was a bad choice. Speaking of locking down, they didn't focus on nursing homes. They focused on inmates and they focused on the homeless and they Mm -hmm. left the aged to die. Right. Okay. So with that in mind, let's start giving our press conferences with some info that isn't about making you retroactively right about something you should never impose in the first place. Yes, Brian. I just had this thought. So I, I totally agree. And obviously it's, it's an adult point of view to modify your thinking as you go along and new information. That's what adults do. Do you remember the, uh, <clears throat> can you guys remember the criticism that was, uh, that was branded on uh, John Kerry? What was John Kerry famous for? John Kerry. The ketchup Empire? Well, what was oh, the no. criticism? He, he, what, he, what, oh, he had the swift boat stuff. Flip flopper. He was, a, he, was a, he was a flip-flopper. Remember, they were flip, throwing flip-flops, and George oh. Bush was successfully branded him a flip-flopper. Oh, sorry. I remember him Good. Him in his swift yeah, I know. I, shit. I, I know. I, sh- I, sh- I should have prepped that a little better. But in the Senate, he, he had so many votes for this and so many votes against this that it was like, oh, you're a flip-flopper. And it's like, ever since then, uh, changing your mind or evolving your opinion has become completely verboten. You can't do that. Yeah. I don't I don't get it. And especially when it's something we've never seen before. So feel free to be very pliable and very mobile and very, very with every bit of new information that comes in, be ready to change, be ready to to modify Um, Factor that in. Yeah. So I would ask i think we should all just go to the beach spread out of town just fucking lay out I, I i have no idea what what we're even doing i don't know what's going on with the restaurants now it's <laughs> they it's, don't either they don't they don't either it's just nobody knows yeah well i mean well, there, there's uh, talks yeah. about it but once all the the george floyd stuff started happening it just disappeared from anybody's <laughs> updates Ascent- Essentially, last Friday, if they if you were in compliance, if your restaurant was in compliance, you could open up no problem. The next day, the riot started and everybody uh, boarded up their businesses. So nobody really knows right well, now. Well, I uh, I don't know. When are we back from Texas? Two weeks now? We just went and ate at steaks every single night, flew on an airplane. No problema. So, all right, I'm done. Moving on. Let's not live in fear, everyone. Look, Bald Brian has medical reasons to do this. The rest of you who went fucking pot committed on this thing, because I think there's a big problem. When I heard about all this doom and gloom and it was all coming for me, coming for me and coming for my kids and everything else, I did not go pot committed. My daughter went all in. She took all her fucking chips and pushed them all across the table. She'll probably have a little PTSD thanks to all the fucking news agencies scaring the fuck out of her over the last three months. And it made, by the way, for plenty of conflict while we're quarantining because she's quarantining and I'm not quarantining. So I have to have a fucking argument with her every time I come back from the house because I'm not a fucking pussy. I'm not fear based and I'm not fucking pot committed. When I heard about this shit, I didn't push all my chips in the middle of the table because I've heard too much of this shit. I threw in like three $10 chips and I was like, I want to see what hand I get dealt before. I want to see the flop. I want to see, see, see the flop. I want to see the river and the flop. I don't even know what the river oh, that's, is. That's the two, that's the two ends. There's, there's a turn in the middle. That, but I want to see that. And I you kept, wanted to see the flop. I kept watching, and they kept trying, and they kept trying, and they kept trying, but I just kept watching, and I was like, eh, I don't think so. So for me, I didn't pot commit. A lot of pussies I know in this town especially when full pot commit, and now they're in. That's all that's all they have. So they're trying to justify their fucking pussy pot commit and they're working hard at it. Uh, don't go the OK, go to the beach. But no, uh, you can jog, but you can fly a kite, but you can't lay in the sand. That's them trying to fucking salvage their pot. They went full pot. You lost it. Write it off and move the fuck on. 
You were fucking fear-based, you're a pussy, and you pot committed. You should have never pot committed on this. Should have never. You should have known who these people are. They're in the scare business. That's what they do. They freak you the fuck out. That's what they do, but you bought in. You should have never pot committed. You throw in a couple chips, wait and hear a little data. Throw in a couple more chips. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe take a few out, but never pot commit. That's what they want you to do. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead. No, you're right. You mentioned don't live in fear, and you mentioned that you know people like me or just me has a reason to uh, uh, to, to 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 follow all take these protocols. We've been to the beach. We've been to the beach a couple of times. We've sat out both times. We go out, we leave our house. We wear, you know, masks and whatever to mitigate our exposure. And all we ask is that people do the same, not do the exact same, but do the same and that they do what's reasonable. You know what I mean? Don't go licking uh, uh, doorknobs, but you know, do what's reasonable. Wash your hands and, and, and maintain a distance if you can. And go to the beach, for God's sake. Just don't sit on someone else's towel. Dawson. Oh, Dawson doesn't have a spleen. That's right. Yeah, I'm one of those dudes. I'm one of those dudes that they say is uh, at risk. Mm-hmm. Um, you wouldn't know it. I don't right. Don't be a one-upper, like I said before. <laughs> Dawson has not modified his uh, schedule much. Strong as an ox. I have not uh, either, <laughs> and I'll be glad that I did not join the group of pussy pot committers when this thing came, and uh, when the next one comes down the pike, and it's coming. It's always, there's always one on deck and one in the hole. There's another reason to have you completely freaked out and completely scared and to go all in on the next, whatever, whatever they're cooking up in the newsrooms right now, be, be prepared. So, uh, think about the concept of pot committing, which is those chips, that's your life. The metaphor of the pot commit, those chips, that's, that's your life. And you have, you don't have an infinite number of chips to play with. You have to kind of decide, you know, how much should I go in? How much should I keep? How much do I leave? How much do I need for other people? And so and so, so on and so forth. And it's like when my daughter was explaining to me in, you know, March, hey, tell all your guys, go home, no more work, tell them to stay in their apartment. I was like, that is not an option. Um, we can do things to mitigate the uh, danger of this, although we never did but I was telling her that, but I can't tell them to go bury themselves in their apartment. That's not, that's not an option. We need to figure out how many, how much to commit and how much to keep, keep safe. And I didn't want to push it all out in front of me because that, that, then you become a ward of the state. You essentially become a ward of the state. You might as well fucking live in an orphanage where Gavin Newsom is the headmaster. Cause when you pot commit, that's it. You're fucking locked in your apartment. You have no income. You can't help other people around you. I provide a lot of income for a lot of people around me. If I pot committed, then I'm out. They're fucking out too. I'm not going to become a ward of the state. And by the way, Garcetti, that fucking pussy, you think I'm going to take marching orders from that fucking pussy? Are you fucking nuts? I'm never going to do that. Why would you ever do that? It's the opposite of living in the United States. It's the opposite of living in California. It's the opposite of all that this country is. So I'm not going to listen to that fucking scared pussy and his fucking platitudes. No way. I'm going to put a few chips in. I'm going to hear what they have to say. I'm going to talk to people and listen to people and study things. I'm not just going to why. And I'm going to keep my eyes open when they start giving me who died. I want to know how old those people were. I want to know if they had pre pre-existing conditions. I start hearing stories about healthy 30 year old guys being ravaged by this disease. I will put in a bunch more chips. When mm-hmm. I start hearing, when I start, when they tell me these stories, when I start seeing like, Oh, these people are at Daytona. They're on the beach. They're frolicking on the beach. They're having chicken fights on the beach. And now, four weeks later, their 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 communities have been decimated by. I'm putting in more chips. If I hear that's if I, pocket, that's pocket kings. Right, putting more chips. If I hear nothing, I'm not putting in more chips. They want me to put in more chips. I'm not putting in more chips. I want to hear some more news. If you guys go full pot committal on everything you hear, you're going to have a horrible life. You, 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 you have to think about your quality of life. It's not their quality of life. It's your quality of life. They have a fine quality of life. They're living the life they want. What do they want? They want to tell you what to do. Oh, good. They're having the fucking greatest day of their life. 
because it's nothing but telling you what to do. But I don't want to do what people tell me what to do. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to endanger other people, and I don't want to be reckless about it, but I will be in charge of that. Let's not listen to the fuck. And by the way, I've interviewed Gavin Newsom for over an hour. That guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. And neither does Garcetti. And this this Dr. Barbara Ferrer chick seems nuttier than both of them. And the least I, I can't think of a person I'd, I'd listen to less about anything. So what are we doing here, people? You pot committed. All right. The people who pot committed, that's on you. You're operating from fear. You fucked up. You listened to the people I told you not to listen to, and you made a mistake, and now you're out. You're out. Fine. Mm. Let's not defend it. You made a mistake. You went all in. You have to go in incrementally. You have to listen to what people say and not to what they're saying on the news. You have to kind of create your own news. You have to hear the stories about all, like, it's like thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of people at uh, Franklin Park in Boston. Okay. I want to hear what happens to those people. I want to know what goes on in that community. I already know next to nothing because we've already done this for the last almost two weeks now, but fine. But in general, let's just use this as a little, a little teachable moment, everyone, not to go pot committed in any facet of life. Always put it. I'm not saying don't put any chips in. When somebody says, hey, we have a virus, it's, we, it's, it's unfamiliar, it's spreading throughout the land, you can go, okay, that sounds like something. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. I'm going to put a few, mm-hmm. few chips in. And then after that, let's keep listening. Let's keep learning. And don't just turn it on Fox or CNN and listen to what they say. They want you to pot commit. You understand? Like they're selling you condos in Daytona Beach. They want this. They want, they're offering a lifestyle to you. Don't just sit and watch. Sit through it. A, 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 short, a short presentation. Yes, it's it's all an informational presentation to scare you. And if you don't get it, why is it always going in the direction of scared? You start hearing things like, we've reached a, a grim milestone of almost 80,000. Well, what do you mean? First off, 80,000 is not a milestone. 100,000 is a milestone. 50,000 is a milestone. And you didn't reach it. You almost reached it, which is not reaching it. Listen to how they word everything, and you'll know. So then keep your chips, have your chips, use your chips wisely, put them in as necessary, but don't pot commit. Too many people pot committed, and now they're fucking bankrupt. And the fucking powers that be, many of them pot committed too, and they're trying to get their money back from the casino by going, uh, well, I'm really concerned about the beaches and the boardwalks. You're fucking lying. You're trying to get your money back. You made a mistake. Open it they're up. They're going full. The desert in has heart. The desert in has heart. <laughs> nice. The desert in has now heart. That you, now that you rehearse the uh, pot committed speech, how's that going to go over with Natalia? <laughs> <laughs> well, Natalia is now living two lives because when I walked into my kitchen last night at 1130, there were four girls making French toast, uh, cinnamon, oh. cinnamon sugar French toast, but I'm also getting the part where, you know, the workman can't come into the building, can't come into the house, but her four friends can have a slumber party. She's sure, starting sure. to modify it. That's the other <laughs> thing about the pot commit. Remember, all the people that are trying to get you to pot commit, they have jobs. And not only have jobs, this mm. is booming business for them. This is salad days for them. This is great ratings and great money. So all the people that are sitting in air conditioned studios telling you to never leave your apartment are getting paid. And so are all the politicians. Everyone's getting paid, but the folks they're telling what to do. So the press who covers them is getting paid. The politicians getting paid. The small businesses that are going under those, they're not getting paid. So also think about what the message is and what the motives are. I mean, how long are you not going to get paid and tell everyone to keep it locked down? I I don't know many of those people. I know Mm -hmm. everyone. So everyone who has a small business is desperately trying to figure out a way to reopen. And everyone who runs the economy and runs the state is busily thinking of ways to stay locked down. You have to understand there's an agenda. 
it's in their it, best interest. It's in their business interest. It's it's a it's a, it's an agenda that is it's it, I don't even say it's volitional sometimes. It's just there's a very different cadence we all have. Everybody in this world, in my world, has maintained getting paid. And every everyone uh, uh, everyone connected with Corolla Digital r- remains has not had an interrupted paycheck. Uh, everyone connected with Chassis Media and the, make all the documentaries. Those people have all been paid. Uh, continue to be paid. No, there's been no interruption. And there's been no decrease, and there's been no interruption. There's been no take a haircut. There's nothing. There is um, the people connected with building, restoration, doing the car, no haircuts, no decrease, um, no interruptions. But if there were, a lot of people would be talking differently. If I said, uh, hey, man, they shut us down and I'll see you whenever, a lot of those people rightfully would be going, hey, when can we get back to it? And those conversations would have had, we would have had those conversations weeks, weeks ago. So remember, everybody who's taking the the uh, pulpit and everyone who's given the press conference and everyone who's covering them, they're all getting paid. They're all coming from a place of getting paid and they don't have businesses that are being looted or glass that's being broken or, mm. or any of that. They except just have CNN. Yeah. Except CNN. <laughs> they a have point. a job. That's true. All it's right. funny. Cause like everyone's like, Oh, insurance will cover that insurance will cover the, the businesses, you know, the small businesses that are well, we're probably going to talk to one la- uh, an owner later, but it's like, yeah. In the mean, the insurance companies don't work swiftly in the meantime, I have no income. Yeah. Right. And speaking of that, I can't remember if we talked about it on here or on KFI that a lot of the insurance covers the structure. It doesn't cover your inventory. Mm. Did, was that on, did that we talk was about on that KFI? No, oh, okay. But so uh, that's going to be very, very tough for a lot of people who got looted. All right, let me hit uh, LifeLock here. Coronavirus sparked an increase in cybercrime complaints to the FBI, like uh, domain names, spoofing, PPE vendors, scams, promising uh, government checks, and fake COVID charities. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our info out on the internet. Cyber criminals keep finding new ways, steal identities. It's things you could miss if you're just... Uh, checking uh, for threats and monitoring your uh, credit. You need LifeLock. You need protection, people. You need the industry standard. It is LifeLock, right, Dawson? LifeLock detects a wide range of identity threats, like your social security number on the sale for sale on the dark web. If they detect your info has potentially been compromised, they'll send you an alert, and you'll have a dedicated restoration specialist for your case. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. LifeLock can see threats you might miss on your own. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code ADAM. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com. Use promo code ADAM for 25% off. All right, we'll get an update from uh, Billy Yang. He's a liquor store owner across from Cedars, where uh, Brian was probably just at, uh, who got the pled his dad was murdered while working there years ago, and now uh, it's been uh, looted again. We'll take a quick break, and we'll come back with that right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, man, what's going on? I really like listening to the uh, clips of your mayor, because I live outside of uh, southeastern Philly, so I don't hear a lot from your mayor. But it's fun listening to a uh, retarded robot communist. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. He's not a robot. Hey, Billy. Uh, Let's check in. Uh, Billy Yang, we talked to, uh, I guess, at the beginning of the week. Um, So how's it going for you right now? Or, Or set the table. Liquor store, family owned, how many years? Yeah. Here we go. So to recap, our family came to this country in 83. And I want to say we started the business around 84, 85. And a typical immigrant family, except our story is that we happened to be in a area that was probably better than most. It's uh, by Cedar sinai um, as you mentioned. But it's not across the street. It's actually a few blocks over. Uh, Across from Jones on third, right? Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, for yeah. people that don't know, when the shit went down in 92, a lot of liquor stores and stuff being looted, but it was kind of south centrally, closer, a little more downtown, and a, not really that part of town. That is a nicer 
more affluent yeah. part of town. Sorry, go ahead. I remember I was probably in the eighth grade. I think, Paul, Brian, you and I are around the same age. And right. I remember. Right. So actually, it's funny, Adam. I actually went to Walter Reed and North Hollywood High. <laughs> wow. And I, yeah, I distinctly remember driving over like Laurel Canyon back towards L.A. because I was in a, sorry, I'm not trying to brag, but I was in the magnet program. So we got bussed over there or driven over there. And as we were driving back, I saw just plumes of smoke everywhere. And, you know, as an eighth grader, you don't really understand exactly what's going on. But, uh, yeah, I just remember it was a scary time. Your dad was shot and killed working there in 94? No, uh, 2004. Oh, 2004. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. So I, I was working a marketing job. And, um, yeah, I, it happened early Saturday morning. I, um, I think I was, I was actually at a holiday party or a company holiday party the night before. And, um, you know, phone just rang off the hook Saturday morning on the 18th of December. And, uh, yeah, um, two guys came in with masks and, um, clubs and, and, uh, took him by surprise. And, you know, my dad was a pretty stoic John Wayne type. And I guess when you have a gun pointed at your face and they run into you, they, your immediate instinct is to grab it and um, they kind of pointed the gun down and shot him in the face and then one more time the head and then just all the stuff I had to like I couldn't unsee because they actually aired it on the news and that Ugh. that was it was just a horrific time and and they shot oh, him yeah. again in the head just to make sure he wasn't gonna survive and and I, I, I ID mean, yeah, them yes. I guess uh, it's it's anyway and they caught the guys yeah. Correct. They did. I mean, thankful. Thankfully, they didn't have a whole lot to go on, and we had to do a press uh, press conference in front of the store. And I just became the de facto spokesperson for the family, and um, we had to ask for the public's help. We didn't have a lot of leads, and um, thanks to the person who broke the case, um, it was it came in in the form of a tip. I think after the uh, plea, he saw that. And uh, called in and turned out, you know, these guys were casing the place for a couple of days. And um, we got video evidence of that. You see them clearly like looking over and, and walking around. So it was, um, you know, all this was re revealed in the, uh, in the courtroom when we were attending trial. As I had mentioned, Judge Ito was our judge. Right. It's so, uh, you know, for me in life, it's weird because I'm, I'm, I'm wired to uh, hate waste. I hate waste. And I, I know it sounds weird when you put it toward a human, but it's the ultimate waste. It's the ultimate waste. I, 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 when I hear about, you know, bank robberies and things that went wrong or criminality or airlines crashing or whatever, airplanes crashing or boats capsizing and people dying, I, I don't, I think, well, a lot of times shit happens. Like that's our society. When I have commercial airliners, event, event, some, there's going to be a bird strike at some point. They're going to crash at some point. But they just sort of shoot in the face for no reason over 80 bucks and a bottle of mezcal tequila. Like I, that stuff drives me nuts because it's such a nothing. There's nothing. I don't know what they made off with. I don't, I don't know what they even took. I don't know why they had to shoot them again like that. And now they're in jail and your dad's, you know, been gone for 16 years and it's all waste to me. I, that, that part drives me nuts. Well, yeah. And, but so is anger and just letting it fester and, and that energy not going anywhere. So I think I told you on the last call that bread I, butter of this show, belly. Yeah. That's all I do is yell. <laughs> I understand the format. I understand the format, but I, I did uh, decide that, you know, from being, it was this weird confluence of two different families, right? In the courthouse, we distinctly saw this family that was broken. And there we were. We were, you know, always dressed in suits, always were a Christian family by and large, although I'm not. But it, it was this confluence of two distinctly different upbringings. And that's when I had an aha moment. And that's when I really decided to pursue, like, I could just be angry about this for the rest of my life or try to at least harness that energy and use it towards good. And, and so that's when I decided to be, uh, become a big brother to a, a black kid in, in Watts. He was six years old at the time and we're still in touch to this day. And, um, 
you know, in light, in the wake of this, yeah, I was angry. I was extremely angry. And every additional clip I see of, of small business owners getting beat up, places getting looted without any conscience, it angers me to no end. But again, I can let that energy fester in me and, and to the point where, where I just have hate in my heart or I can try to channel that energy for good. So like yesterday, I spent the day in the mountains with a, a black friend of mine named Kyle, and we just talked about ideas about how we can help the inner city through our collective networks. He's a he's a musician. He works on the um, he tours with Katy Perry and and works on a daytime show. Um, what's her name? Kelly Clarkson. Yeah. When, yeah. Inter- when you introduce him, do you say this is my black friend Kyle? Uh, yeah, I mean, just you know, for points. Well, sure, if for course, no other, yeah, yeah. if for no other reason than you know, Kyle is the de facto yeah. white frat boy name. That's right. <laughs> no, but I, yeah. I, I do think I do think all of this like negative energy can be harnessed and used towards good. And so you know, this is a cause that I strongly believe in, and um, I think that's at least a a productive way of of uh, grieving, if you will. Did so. Let's get up to date. The store was looted on what day? And vandalized. Saturday night. Saturday night, The uh, that's when the protests happened at nearby Pan Pacific Park. And then um, the it was relative, I mean, it was pretty peaceful, except, no, that's not true, because I rushed up from where I live in Hermosa Beach when I saw it moving westbound, and I saw police cars on fire. So I drove to the store, we locked up, I sent my mom home, and I stood in front of the store for a while until... Um, until my it was just chaos so i drove home to be with my sister and my mom to protect them i guess or just make sure they felt safe and then i got the call from the alarm company later that evening and they had ripped open the the gate in the front they had busted it open and the inside was basically gutted there were two guys in there actually when i showed up really and, um, was there anything yeah. left on the shelves what were the two guys going for uh, I mean, it was cut it pretty well. Actually, there were some, there was a, a decent amount of like, Mangria. Know, like high-end caps. Mangria. <laughs> <laughs> Mangria and um, Zima. Actually, uh, I did, I was able to manage to uh, grab some uh, high-end caps. And uh, I'd, oh, love, yeah. I'd love to be able to gift it to Gina Adambald, the, um, the, the lackeys. If you're into that stuff, sure. Oh, please. So thank you for all this time awesome. for um, you know, just all the years of entertainment. Well, let's. Uh, how's the go? Uh, <sighs> sorry, how's the uh, GoFundMe <laughs> working out? Oh God, uh, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to speak without getting emotional. Um, I, the following day, I had a conversation with uh, one of my oldest friends, and he gently nudged me to to do this. You know, I have a very immigrant mindset from the way my dad raised me to pull yourself up by bootstraps kind of talk. And I was reluctant because it felt like a handout, but I finally obliged. And I think uh, it was like an arbitrary number, 15K. That was met within the first couple of hours. And then I think the next day or two, it doubled. So, um, you know, we're finding out we're not going to get a lot from our insurance. Um, it's kind of being seen as why? complete loss. We're still- Wait a minute. Why aren't you? <laughs> this becomes a, a theme of uh, theme. today's show. But why aren't you going to get a lot from your insurance or at least a fair amount from your insurance? I don't know. My sister is dealing with that aspect of the business right now. This is all being relayed to me because I actually, you know, I have a separate job in, a, in the store. I've helped out you know, twice a week on weekends. So I don't have a full grasp on the insurance side of things, if I'm honest. But the insurance is, is not going to make you whole. No. And no, uh, so what's the GoFundMe up to now? Is it at $30,000? I don't know. Is this off 33? Oh, 33. Yeah. That's All right. great. Almost I will, 34. I will uh, tell people to donate to uh, save the St. Regis on GoFundMe. And uh, let's get them, get it up to 50 so this hardworking uh, immigrant family can uh, get their life back together as, as much as you can. You know, you, you, it's not all about uh, product and inventory and shelving. You know, there's a, there's a, tra- there's a trauma here that, you know, I was kind of, 
thinking about with my daughter the other day, which is like she's been she has a little PTSD. She's been traumatized sure. a little bit. A lot of people have been traumatized a little bit. And, you know, insurance checks are great and GoFundMe is fantastic. But that'll physically put everything back together, just like you could put a car back together. But if you've been in a bad accident, sometimes there's there's some residue there. And it, and I guess that residue is you. you Well, you've already been through this process, Billy. You can choose to do something with that residue and sort of fester and fear and anger is probably just giving um, it's like a bank account that it's getting compound interest in a negative way. And, or you can do something positive, find uh, the one black man named Kyle and go on a hike. <laughs> Wait, what's his name? Kyle. Oh, Kyle. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And, and think of things, think of things to do. And by the way, you know, think of things to do. It, 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 it occupies you. You know what I mean? Like having a plan, like coming up with an idea. I don't think people realize how important it is to have something to do, to have a purpose. Like literally just, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to pull weeds. It sounds dumb, but it gives you a purpose. It like gives you a direction. It gives you something to do. That's why you're almost never unhappy or unsatisfied when you do that, you know that weekend where you go, I'm going to clean the garage this weekend. You think about those few weekends you want. I'm just going to turn up the stereo and I'm going to get my hands dirty. Um, you've never been unhappy during those periods. You know, you've had something yep. to do. You've had some purpose. You have a direction. You have something that occupies you. you need to get back. Well, can to I that. run the yes? Can I run the idea by you, Adam, real quick? Because sure. uh, I had this epiphany when I took my. I told you I reconnected with my little brother and I'm still, he's still in my life. And we went for a hike and I just saw how he lit up. Catholic little brother or little brother program. No, it's the, it's the uh, little brother, big brother, little brother program. Right. I just didn't want people at home thinking you're talking about a little brother who was. Your actual brother. Right, right, right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, And I just saw how he lit up in the outdoors because when you're outside, you know, you talk about it all the time, going on walks and it's just something about that. Not only does it open up, um, so really some endorphins, but it reveals this whole other world. I'm sure they don't otherwise have access to. So I want to try to combine that because I do the kind of work that I do is, you know, I'm a filmmaker in the outdoor space. And, and so I, this is my world. And I want to try to combine that with the inner city with also just networking, you know, getting mentors involved and networking and giving, if they want to, if they're interested in music, if they're interested in podcasting at maybe, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Maybe you can open up your studio for tours so that people can see. Like, these are all the ideas. All oh, right. Like, I'm so trying I, to bridge I get, that gap. So I can get yeah. looted, too? No, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you, Bob Dixie. I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I do that all the time. I love doing that. I'm completely open to it. So if you want to reach out okay. off the air, so to speak, and... Uh, come up with it's some still half baked ideas it's still half baked but yeah all right well when it gets to the seven eighths baked mark which, you, which they rarely discuss uh, <laughs> so it's it's half, yeah when you get when you get somewhere into the 15th 16th baked zone uh hit hit us up and i'll i'll happily open my doors and heart uh but not my wallet to have mm-hmm. you guys uh, come in and mentor and take tours and, and look at the shop, the production as well. All right. Thank uh, you. Billy, thank you uh, very much. We're going to do Eat Your Feelings, Max Pata. Warburton. I'm trying to work out the math here, but yes. Billy, send me a bottle of Screaming Eagle. Thank you. Screaming Eagle. Thank- Thanks, Billy. Appreciate That's it. That's a $1,000. It's a $1,000 bottle of I knew it wasn't <laughs> two bucks, Chuck. All right. Should we do a, a quick, we'll do a quick Eat Your Feelings here, and Indeed. we'll bring on Patrick Warburton. Gina Grads, Eat Your Feelings, brought to you by Home Chef. She could not stop eating the sugar and the grains. Then our friend Betty held her. Lose the weight she gained Now she's cooking Healthy meals at night And ever since then Her clothes aren't as tight It's time For each of your feelings Do some healthy eating With Gina's recipe What do we got? 
Go ahead, sir. So obviously this isn't our, our normal eat your feelings. We're all at home and you can't uh, have anything that I cooked. So oh, I'm going to try and paint the best word picture I can. I got to tell you, I was um, gifted some of these home chef uh, meal kits and I've never done a meal kit before. And when I cook, it's very experimental. I'll make something up from scratch or I'll heavily modify it to the point where I don't know if it's going to work. A lot of times it doesn't. And I start over and I do it again until something sort of edible comes out or hopefully delicious. This is not a concern with Home Chef. I don't know how common this is, but oh my God, the, the pictures are literally step by step. The instructions are very easy to tackle. I've done three so far. I did the beef and broccoli. We did the roasted beet and pistachio risotto, which at first I was like, huh, one of the mo most delicious things I've ever had. And the we, last night we did the miso butter salmon and green bean with almonds. And I have pictures if you could put those up. Uh, These are what we made. That's the ooh. beef and broccoli. Oh, that's and good. Oh. It, it was uh, it was so much fun because Andy made that while I made the risotto and we had a blast. Keep going. Show me the other Let pictures. Let me ask you guys uh, this that's quickly. The Sorry, with mm. the beef and broccoli. You did you the beef was cut in a way that's much thinner. It's it, sliced like bulgogi style, like that uh, Korean barbecue. Uh, yes, style. I like that so much better. I find myself yeah. oftentimes with sort of chunks, big kind of chunks yeah. of beef, and you're yeah. gnawing yeah. on it for a while, and it's screwing up the ratio of the beef and the broccoli. That's the way you're to do it. You're absolutely right, and because it came this way, Andy goes, "Oh my god." I, I didn't even realize it because it is so perfect. He goes, I'm going to go to the butcher shop and ask for this kind of beef and make my own Philly cheesesteak in a bowl type thing. So it was just a great idea to have that kind of sliced beef and keep going because last night's was really the most incredible thing we ever had. Keep going. Uh, the salmon with miso butter. Mm. Holy yes. hell. And now, as you guys know from my offerings, I never do fish. I'm afraid to cook fish. I, I don't know how. I didn't grow up eating it. I'm I'm just afraid it's going to be overcooked, undercooked. I don't do it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to tackle this salmon. The salmon's not going to get the best of me. Freaking easy. All you do is pat it dry, some salt and pepper, put it skin side up, sear it, and then throw it in the oven. It was delectable. It was perfect. It was crispy on top. The miso butter was white miso paste, butter, and uh, garlic. And yes. it was so like savory and nice. umami. And we, every bite, we just wish we could keep eating it. And then just these simple green beans. It was just, we're, we're having so much fun cooking these things. And we have our little one here who loves to cook and he's doing it with us. And it's just I mean, really, really kudos and applause to Home Chef because it is delicious food, easy to make, inventive recipes that I've never thought of and very, very good. I'm, nice. I'm so impressed. Well, oh, yeah, I'll tell you about my experience in a second. All right, let's bring it home because uh, Warburton's uh, waiting on, on hold. Beat your feelings. Do some healthy eating. And we Gina's recipe. Thank you, Gina Grant. Brought to you by Home Chef. Oh, well, there you go. So many meal kit services out there. Yeah, let me hit Home Chef here. It's hard to find the right one for you. Let's, uh, that's what sets Home Chef apart. Simply choose your menu and adjust the delivery dates. Box arrives at your doorstep weekly with recipe cards and fresh, perfectly portioned ingredients. Oven-ready recipes just combine the pre-chopped ingredients and ready-to-cook uh, throwaway tins, so it's that much easier. Toss it in in uh, 30 minutes or so. No prep, uh, no mess. You're ready to eat. They even do uh, meals that are ready in 15 minutes. Olga did me the uh, steak with the chimichurri butter and the side oh, yeah. of asparagus. So if those of you who are nice. staying keto, that's the most delicious way you can do it for a limited time. Go to homechef.com slash Adam. Get 30 bucks off. That's homechef.com slash Adam for 30 bucks off. All right, we'll take a very quick break. We'll come back with Patrick Warburton right after this. I'm your emotional support animal. It shows just how fucking petrified of the Twitter mob every public figure is nowadays. 
The fact that they've talked good people who have never harmed anyone into giving preemptive apologies to nut jobs is outrageous. Written and narrated by Adam Carolla. Consequently, I'm starting with a warning. I'm not going to apologize for anything in this book. Pre-order it now at adamcarolla.com. Patrick Warburton has joined us. Always good to hear from Patrick Warburton. Inheritance, a movie we talked about with uh, Connie Nielsen, is uh, available on Amazon, iTunes, and on demand as well. And also Space Force, which is uh, available right. on Netflix, which I forgot about. Good to see you, Patrick. Good to see you, Adam. Uh, I, I, I see you, I follow your career because, uh, you're pretty ubiquitous. Like you pop up a lot and a lot of projects and rental car commercials. And it's just, you're just <laughs> there. But I, I thought, and I, it's something I, I talked to a lot of people about because as you get, you blink your eyes, you've been doing this for 30 years, you know, and you think, I was talking about this with Kevin Bacon. I was talking about this with Rob Lowe. It's like, do you have to get up and sort of pedal every day? Do you have that feeling of like, I got to get out there and churn and burn? What is your, what's your mindset? Well, a little bit. I'm probably not as um, ambitious or aggressive as I once was, you know, I'm 55. I like to play golf. I have a family and um, I, I just, you know, you kind of get worn out by the whole process, you know, at times after a while, it's nice when some good opportunities, you know, show themselves, but oftentimes you gotta, you gotta, you know, fight for things that, you know, to try to get involved in things outside of what, you know, normally you're perceived to do, you know, they put you in a box in this town, you know, oftentimes it's hard to, to find opportunities outside of the realm of certain things that you just sort of perceive. For me, it's playing dumb nitwits, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I was, it's so much of it is a, a physicality. I was doing a take a knee episode, my motivational podcast with uh, Eric Stromer. And we we're kind of, Eric was, he's a really good looking dude, you know? And when he was 30 or 26, he was really good looking. He's been on like, you know, uh, people's sexiest man issue and stuff like that. But he's also got a great sense of humor and he's got a really fun sort of energy to him. But every single audition for him is, you know, put on these uh, put on these shorts and put on these dolphin shorts and take your shirt off and go do this shitty dialogue because we're casting for this for Santa Barbara, the uh, soap opera, you know. And in a way, I said, you know, the great news about looking like me or looking like Jimmy Kimmel's, we got to actually go sit around and figure out what we wanted to do and then go do it. No one was casting us in anything or telling us we want this, but we don't want that. And Patrick is a big, tall, good looking, strapping glass of water and probably got pushed that way. I might have been at one time, Adam. It's, uh, the looks are fading. <laughs> But uh, what do you think of the stash? This is an, I've never had a stash. I, I can't even take myself seriously when I look in the mirror. Nice. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. I like it. it. It's regal. Like it. Yeah. yeah, I like it. It gives you a certain gravitas. You know, that, <laughs> the voice, the 6263 frame. I'm going to believe anything you tell me to do. <laughs> Maybe one day I might be able to do my first Western. Would you Something like to, would, would you like to do your first western? I would. I mean, I I guess I have. Nah, flick of two doesn't really count as a western. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always interested in those guys like, you know, you take guys like Kevin Costner and they love that era. They love riding horses, they love the boots, you know, they love the the guns, the 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 America that was that, you know, and so they go I'm going to go recreate that for extended periods of time. And therefore, in a weird way, you get to live that life because you're yeah. putting on a duster and getting on a horse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How, uh, well, <laughs> how's the Pearl Jam fanaticism and the uh, Dodge Challenger? <laughs> it's all uh, uh, alive and well. You know, of course, of course, my garage band, um, you know, we haven't been able to rehearse or play in quite some time. But I thought, you know, we're the one band 
that probably could have played at any point during this pandemic because I don't think we've ever had a crowd of much more than 20 people. And I think <laughs> pretty much it's almost been um, okay at this point. I want to talk about your band. So I was, I know you're a Pearl Jam fanatic, but I didn't know you had your own band. Oh, I got a little, I got a little cover band, a little dad band. I, it, like on those Cialis commercials? Yeah. It's <laughs> One black guy. I mostly do it to humiliate my children, <laughs> my adult children. What do you cover? But, what do you, what's your set list? Well, we'll cover uh, mostly Vetter and you know, Pearl Jam tunes. We cover some Dylan tunes, but try to do it more in the vein of how Vetter would do it. We do a couple of Tragically Hip songs, some Doors tunes, and um, yeah, we try to mix it up a little bit. So it's not, it, we're the bearded Pearl Clams. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> but we do. You, know, you know what you should make your uh, alter ego name be? Yes. Eddie Better. Oh, if, if there yeah. isn't one already, you've there, that there has mantle. to be. I, uh, I love my, I think my favorite Pearl Jam song is better, man. I just love that song. I love the drums in that song. So it's a little yeah. raw. It's not overly produced and it's got it's such a great theme. Like when, and it kicks in, it just kicks in. I don't, I like songs that have a little slow build and the burn at the beginning and then, kick in do you guys cover better man no oh um, <laughs> i'm sorry but you know there's so, thanks for but, coming <laughs> there's so much depth to the band and better and, and and you know and everything they do so you know from the grinders to his ukulele album or to you know the soundtrack to in the wild there's just so many beautiful songs and and you know and uh and nasty ones too i mean there's just uh They've got an amazing, there's just an amazing library of about three decades of, you know, music. So uh, crazy that, you know, in a weird way, I think of Pearl Jam as a new band, mm. as opposed to, you think about The Doors and Led Zeppelin and all that kind of stuff, but the new band that's that's been around yeah. for 30 years, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it is strange to think about so, so many of those bands that, started just you know in the like we don't think of a band like zz top to be like as old as led zeppelin but i think they are aren't they i think they were making music at the same time led zeppelin was making music but you i you know you associate zz top with you know music videos in the 80s and of course they have a huge you know just a huge legacy a huge breadth of you know their library but i still think of zz top as a much newer band than say zeppelin yeah, well, they... technically, if it was 90 or 95, uh, Pearl Jam could be considered classic rock now. Yeah. How does a classic rock thing go? Like, so, like, they have weird rules. Like, in California, if your car can't pass smog, you could get a <laughs> smog exemption if it's more than 25 years old or something like that. What, is there a classic rock cutoff, like 30 years or 25? Uh Back at the state at uh, at the sound where I worked, it was 25 years. Interesting. Yeah. Patrick, uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about you. So what's a day? What's a, everything shut down in, in terms of production? Obviously. So what's what's a day like for you? Well, I, you know, I, I sort of feel like eh, I don't know dorky the sounds but we've sort of made lemonade out of lemons here we've had all four of our adult kids under one roof for the first time in years mm. you know and we got five dogs so we've hung out an awful lot together as a family and that's been great and watched a lot of stuff we've gotten drunk and done karaoke together and we sort of live on the outskirts you know we're a little bit in the country sort of so you know there's there's nice areas to walk around so we've been able to get outside um so i mean work you know nil but as far as um it's it, i feel like we've been you know pretty blessed uh, in our situation i got buddies you know in la in the middle of la like my buddy john walk who, who's been working on uh, uh your man kimmel show for years he's been on that for the last 20 years you know he lives in like a 500 600 square foot apartment off of melrose and has not had 
any contact with another human being for three months and he is losing his mind. Yeah. Um, well, so other- much of it is, you know, it. I, I, I was going to say luck of the draw, but a lot of it is where are you when these things happen? So the very first, uh, thinking about the riots, if ni- 1992, I lived in Los Angeles. I was pretty much debt. I was poor. I I wore, I drove in a Zuzu trooper. (laughs) I I was a carpenter. And if this shit would have hit, whether it be, especially the pandemic, the lockdown, that whole thing, I would have been trapped in a small apartment with an angry lesbian roommate and her, and her angrier cat and had no income and been contemplating suicide somewhere around week three and a half. Now I have a job. I have income. And I live in 7,500 square feet and I got a swimming pool in the background. No problem. That's right. And you can work from home. You can just do the show like you're doing it, which is. I'm at the, the studio, but I can just drive from my house to the studio. Well, your studio is like your house. With right. Your cars, right. Your yeah. That's an awesome pad you got there. Well, yeah, back, you know, in, in the early 90s when that that all went down, I was trapped in a little apartment in Palms, Culver City with uh, an angry wife. That's who I was. <laughs> Mm, not the same wife who's angry today, right? <laughs> no, she's <laughs> the same wife plus angry. <laughs> right. So you, you think about like, where are you? It, so it's, it's, it's a lot about timing. You know, it's the, this, this lockdown for me, it's not, it came later. I was established. So I'm comfortable. So for my kids, it comes earlier. But if it catches you when you're 23 and you're just finishing whatever and you're between jobs and you have the roommate and the crappy little apartment in the neighborhood no one wants to live in, then you're fucked. You're shit out of luck at that point. So, so much of it is just that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, agreed. I think the kids have actually been all pretty happy that they're here, you know, and, and that we've all, you know, we've all been able to sort of keep each other entertained for the last few months because it's, you know, it's been going on for a while where it's, you know, rough to be outside. What was a 17 year old high school version of Patrick Warburton like? Well, listen, and, and I know just, just to preface this, I, when I was a 13 year old, I, I was the smallest kid in high school. I weighed, 95 pounds and I had Coke bottle glasses. And I mean, I was, you know, and I, I had to get bust an hour to school to Servite, which is an all boys school in Anaheim. So that's not fun. Cause I don't fit in there. I can't play football. They recruit football players. I'm not an academic. So I have a miserable day at school. And then when, after I get off a one hour bus trip home, you know, like there'd be these bullies that would wait and like, spit on, spit on me when I'd be walking home. So it was pretty rough in the early days. Fortunately for me, I had the growth gene and I started growing and then um, then life got a little bit easier. It also got a little bit easier for me when I was able to transfer to a local public high school. So by the time I was 17, I was at Newport Harbor High School ditching class to go surfing every now and then with buddies and, 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 and feeling like there was a light at the end of the tunnel. So 17 and 18 wasn't bad. But that's what, right when things started getting a little bit better for me. Where did you, did you go off to college? Was, where, where did the drama bug come in? Uh, where, when did the acting kick in? How did that all work? I went to Orange Coast College. I was getting nowhere. I couldn't transfer to any worthwhile university. And I, I knew that that wasn't really going to be, um, it just didn't seem like the direction I was headed. And... I, I just, you know, I thought it was narcoleptic because I fell asleep in every class I had. I was rowing crew at the coast and I also hadn't discovered coffee yet. So I wasn't drinking coffee and I was just falling asleep in class. And I, I just bailed out after about uh, three semesters there and um, just started hitting the bricks up in L.A. like everybody else does, you know. Yeah. Coming I mean, out that, on auditions. Yeah. But that was even back in the day when because I, I guess even then you were already 
on K Rock, right? Weren't you already doing working with K Rock? I time? started with K Rock in '94. Oh, okay. So it All wasn't right. wouldn't, no, no, wouldn't no, have been was, th- that early, probably. Well, well before that. Okay. All right. Well before. So. <laughs> It's funny that Patrick had a crappy apartment in Palms. I too had a crappy apartment in Palms. Feels like everyone I know had a crappy apartment in Palms. And yes, it's on the west side. But Adam, it's uh, in line with the theory of uh, uh, places shouldn't shouldn't be allowed to name themselves because Palms sounds right. so nice. It's right. it's a it's a it's a stucco jungle. It's dicey. Right. Yeah, we were on Valparaiso. Did you yeah. know that? Reed? Yeah, I was on Regent. I think right off of Overland. By the way, Val- or motor, motor, motor. Patrick, club, watch club out because when you say to uh, folks, I was on Valparaiso, they think it's herpes medication. <laughs> <laughs> so just be careful. Don't say it out loud at like a dinner or anything. That's back when I was, I was at Valparaiso. <laughs> we were on Valtrek Street. And... <laughs> no, I referred to it. Yeah, I've I I still say the leader in the clubhouse is Hawaiian Gardens. I don't think no, you yeah, could have a, not gonna a, beat that. a better sounding worse city than Hawaiian Gardens. I don't even really know if I've been to <laughs> I think Huel Hauser's been to Hawaiian Gardens. Are there some Hawaiian Gardens something? I grew up on the border of Hawaiian Gardens. Oh, how, how bad is Run. Hawaiian Gardens? Run. It's, it's rough. I mean the yeah, the big highlight is their their casino. Mm. Um but yeah, oh, I, mean, well, I, no. I never liked walking walking through. What do you think's worse, Garden? Uh, Kalen lives there now. <laughs> oh, sorry, Kalen. Oh no. What's uh, what's worse is is Gardena. Gardena sounds pretty good too, but Gar- is Gardena worse than Hawaiian Gardens? I think Hawaiian Gardens is known a little bit more for its violence. Mm, sure, um, but but it, I mean, great Mexican places on the outskirts. But you're right; the Samoan people are very aggressive. <laughs> very aggressive. I I agree. I don't want to categorize, but yes. Thank you. And by the way, what's more misleading than Riverside? Mm. Yeah. Desolate, desolate Riverside. There has to be a sanctioning body. Like, yeah. I, I can't go into the DMV and go, I want a vanity plate called Kill the Jews. <laughs> They'd go like, uh, uh That's no, way too many letters, sir. Can't. <laughs> no, I was going to, I would work it out. I'd use a little uh, of my own yeah. rainbow tape to modify it, but like- <laughs> Do, they just go, no, you can't do that. Like I feel we need to do that with cities. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, Palm sucks. Yeah. And Panorama Palmdale. Panorama City sounds like some sort of city of the future. It's like e- yeah. Elon Musk must have invented Panorama City. Panorama City is a shithole. Gina, you're right. Palmdale, 29 Palms. Yeah. Palm, no more Palms. Yeah, you're not allowed. I agree. Well, yeah. You know, uh, you know, the old 69 Charger you brought up there, uh, Adam, when I first got, because I wanted to get customized plates for it, you know, just for fun. It said Brock 69. And because um, uh, I do a, I do a cartoon called The Venture Brothers and Brock Sampson drives a 69 Charger and that's what we got. So my son said, you got to get this car. And that's when we got the car. And I had to jump through hoops to get the license plate to say Brock 69 because they had issues with it. They thought that uh, 69, uh, that this was that this was some kind of, a, uh, you know, sex thing. Right. And uh, it's just uh, 69 is the year of the car. And uh, they go, well, we got to check. And they the, the person at the DMV went in the back and checked and came back. And eventually they gave me the go ahead. There's the car. Wow. What is yeah. this? Some kind of sex thing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's. It's interesting. I mean, that's a perfect example. Like they have to vet it. Now, the thing that, the thing that I do love about, what's, it what's that, Patrick? Sorry, it's a dumb joke. You said they have to vet it. I said it's a dodge. Mm, oh. Good, good. Yep. <laughs> that, that's vet kind of dodge. My, I, kid, I, my I, kids remind me that I need writers, and I. <laughs> no vet is good. It could even be an Eddie vet er kind of wow. kind of uh, thing, but. Uh, the thing that's so precise about the science of the folks who work at the DMV is they go, not so fast. That sounds like a 69 sexual position and we don't want to send that message out to the public. And then they go, oh, we checked the VIN number. It is a 69 charger. Go ahead. But what difference does that practically make to the to the Amish kids who are behind you in a buggy? 
That that's right, and maybe maybe it just does mean that. Maybe I only got a '69 car, so I could get it. Put this name, this number '69, on my license plate. Diabolical. But he think dirty thoughts. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> so, are you still? Uh, well, I think we. I think I saw you brought one of your chargers out here for some car cast years ago. Was that the same Dodge? Yes, I have one fun special car i'm i don't have a world-class <laughs> collection like somebody else i know mm. i just well, have the... you know Jill, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. you got some very special vehicles yeah i i do and i'm glad i'm glad i do and i'm glad to drive them and um i'll tell you there's something i'll tell you a very weird yet satisfying part of of that world which is we're kind of creeping up on the Laguna Seca vintage race, which is always the big, big circle on the calendar every year for all the vintage racers. And I'm starting to prep the car I'm going to bring because you have to prep them. There's always stuff to do before you go out and race them. And there's something really satisfying about the prep part of, of, what I have to do to the car and then what I'm going to do with the car. Like I'm going to get in that car and I'm going to race the shit out of it. But there's a lot that goes on before you get it out there. And it's a, like we were sort of talking before it's like occupies your mind, has a planning aspect to it, has a sort of mechanical aspect to it, has a, it's also kind of a, like, it's like you're packing for a camping trip. Like you can't forget things. You can't ignore things. You, you know, you can have five cans of beans, but if you have no can opener, you're, you're fucked. So there's like a lot of that, but there's something very satisfying about it that more people should do on some level. It's cool. Listen, how much racing do you do? Well, I, I had a few events canceled. I mean, I had a Laguna Seca Trans Am race, a professional race canceled at the beginning of May. Uh, I do three, uh, three or four events a year, maybe. I have only done the two, the Toyota races that we did. One, I tried to take out a wall and uh, I lost <laughs> oh, the no. wall one. I had a violent accident, missing a, a downshift on that back straightaway there. And then the other one, I ran a very aggressive race where um, I speared you like in a corner. It was totally uncool. That was the year. Remember Adrian Brody. Brody, yes, yeah, passed a number of us on a caution flag. Yes, and it was like it was the best. It was the best. That was the best race I'd ever run, and I got <laughs> fourth that year because as I was sitting there on a caution, he just went right by, and I'm like. Do we not play by the rules? I know it's a celebrity car race, but are there are there still not rules? Like, don't we play by those rules? I, re I, I remember that as if it was uh, yesterday. And but you won that, you won that race one year, didn't you? I ra I won two years. You won uh, two years. Yeah, it's celebrity in the pro division too. Then the next year. But not that year that we raced. I guess 2010 was it, right? This there's an interesting the uh, the Adrian Brody part of that equation to me was something I've thought about a lot, <laughs> and the reason and the, well, here's our here here can be all our takeaway from that. Um, when you're racing, you have a little little pink mist, you know, like you're 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 seeing red. The adrenaline's pumping. You're you're going, you know, and there's flags, and they're always telling you pay attention to flags, look for the flags. And sometimes the people ahead of you see the flags. Oftentimes, the people ahead of you see the flags before you get to the flag station. And there's yeah. yellow flags, which is caution, and there's black flags and red flags. There's a whole bunch of flags mean a whole bunch of different things, but you have to look out for them. But there's a part, and this will apply to any part of life, which is if there are a bunch of people ahead of you and they qualified ahead of you and they've been ahead of you for seven and a half laps and you find yourself slingshotting past all of them on a straightaway, driving the same equipment, then that a little bell should go off in your head and think, why was I able to pull up next to a bunch of people who are ostensibly faster than I am? And 
with the same car, the same weight, and the same horsepower, and the same tires, and the same everything across the board, why was I able just to go past four of them? And that should let you know that maybe they're not at 100%. Maybe yes. they saw the caution flag and maybe they backed off because anyone who's done that race knows that when you go around the hairpin at the end of the shoreline drive, at the end of the, it doesn't matter if Ayrton Senna and uh, Ayrton Senna had a baby with Mario Andretti and he's in the car next to you. Once you guys are just flat out, nobody's pulling anybody you're the exact same car you're going the exact same speed and it doesn't it doesn't matter how incredibly skilled the other people are they make it up in the corners they make it up breaking late but if you're just passing people in the straightaway those people in the straightaway are not on it and uh no that probably should have been apparent to uh to adrian yeah I should let it go, probably. Hey, did you see? Uh, <laughs> Me too. Did you, did you see uh, the, the Senna doc on uh, Netflix? It was great. Of course. Oh, yeah. 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 Great one. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories about that Senna doc is um, I was talking to uh, Tony Kanan, I think. I think it was a guy, uh, Tony yeah, Kanan. It was Tony Kanan. Tony Kanan's a, a veteran indie driver. He's driven at the 500 a lot. He's been in here, talked to him about uh, on CarCast and stuff like that. But here's a very interesting thought. He said, he said, oh, well, you know, when I was a kid, I was a good go-kart racer. You got to figure out, Max Pata, how much older Ayrton Senna was than Tony Kanaan. But when Tony Kanaan was maybe Brazilian, a champion race car driver, and he said, Ayrton Senna had a track set up like on his property and at his house or whatever. And every year he would invite the best go-karters in the land, the best young guys, the best 12 year old, 13 year old go-karts to come to his house and have a race with him against world champion Ayrton Senna. Senna's 14 year, 14 years old, older. So yeah, Senna would have been, you know, 25 in the prime and, and Tony Kanaan would have been 11 or whatever, but a champion driver. And they'd have a race. And I said, uh, well, but Tony is as fast as Ayrton Senna was and a, a, a champion F1 driver. You were 11 years old. He w- You were probably giving away 20, 30 pounds. You had a weight advantage. You would have been faster in a go-kart with that limited horsepower because Ayrton was a full-grown man and he weighed more. So, and he won, Tony Kanaan won. And he said, no, Ayrton, he added weight to all our (laughs) (laughs) go-karts. As a fun charity (laughs) go-kart race on his property with young, with young, young racers, he added weight to everyone's cart. Make it fair. (laughs) Champion for a reason. It it does. No, it's true. It's a huge advantage. Like the, 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 a, a nine-year-old could whoop up on Ayrton's ass in a go-kart if he was carrying around 50 pounds less weight easily. Um, I just always kind of remember that. I, I just remember that story, and it made it made complete sense. Where was Was that at his house, Maxipan, or on his property? Something like that, man. So you know, are you saying that the 12-year-old still beat Santa with uh, carts that weighed the same? Tony Kanan... Now okay. I didn't I didn't verify it, but yeah. he did beat him with the weight added. But you also have to understand, all Tony Kanan is doing at that point is racing go karts full time, right. and all Ayrton is doing is racing F one cars full time. Mm-hmm. So it's you're getting into another piece of equipment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Anything, Max Pana? I don't know what that story is. Yeah, I'm still looking. All right. Uh, should we take a quick break and come back with Patrick and do the news? Yeah, let's do, do that right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Breaking viral. All those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Need news with Gina Gina Grad. 
News with Gina Grad. The uh, racetrack, sorry, Gina, was on Senna's family farm. As a family oh. farm with a go kart track on it. Just like your childhood. Well, we we had an oval. It was it was a foot. It was a thirty degree banked oval. Right. It wasn't as big as Talladega, but yeah, I get it. Same thing. Race car track. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Idyllic. Right. Um, so some pretty big news as we record this that uh, that that just broke um, not too long before the show started. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison plans to elevate charges against the former police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck. He now wants to add charges of aiding and abetting as well to the three officers who were just sort of standing around the scene. So this is pretty big. Uh, the the other officers, it was Tu Thao, Alexander Kung, and Thomas Lane will be charged with aiding and abetting second degree murder. Um, and there they spoke on conditions of anonymity, but I'm pretty sure at this point it's it's everywhere. Chauvin, he was the f- now former officer who who was kneeling on George Floyd's neck. He was arrested last Friday, charged with third degree murder and manslaughter, but that has been upgraded. And um, I looked into it a little, but I don't know how it varies from state to state. So this is definitely a Mark Garagos conversation and not a Gina Grad conversation. But um, just a little light research on well, what's the difference? What's second degree murder? And that's generally defined as intentional murder that lacks premeditation and intended to only cause bodily harm and demonstrate an extreme indifference to human life. This is the difference so, between improv and scripted. Basically, sure. Been said yeah. many times. Huh? Sure. Uh, Mark Garagos, Mark Garagos should defend one of these cops just to make oh, him the God. least popular person on the planet. Because well, no, to extend his lead, at least popular person. He's already he's already there. Right. Yeah, he's already on Mount Rushmore. Because I talked to him. We did a special um, podcast yesterday. A reasonable doubt. Because Scott Peterson's going to get a new trial. And uh, uh, Garagos is uh, knee deep in that. But uh, Scott, it's a it's an interesting story. And the reason he's probably going to get a retrial is they they had a death penalty juror selection. So they say so Mark Garagos says, like, you know, when a realtor says location, 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 for him, it's jury, 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 jury selection, jury selection, jury selection. You want to get what you want. You want to get the result you want. It's all about jury selection. And he'll tell you that, you know, black women are tougher on crime or white males are more sympathetic toward X, Y, and Z. Like the, he knows. And, and it's all, that's why they argue so much over the selection. They got the death penalty. So when you're doing a death penalty um, case, when the, when the, the when the when the state is seeking the the death penalty, when they do the juror selection, you have to be okay with the death penalty. They can't select you if you go. I'm fundamentally against the death penalty. I'm never gonna I'm never gonna okay that. They need to know that if you believe this person is guilty or we can convince you this person is guilty and we're going for the death penalty, you, you're going to do that. But what ends up happening is it becomes a kind of self-selecting group that are a lot tougher on crime. Sure. As you think about it, you know, yeah. if you're for the death penalty or if you, yeah, if, if you say that question, yes, of course you're going to be, you know, tougher. Imagine if you just took a group where it's like, Hey, uh, you like barbecue or are you vegan? You'd get a different group in there with different thoughts toward punishment and crime and and that kind of thing. And uh, so they got the death penalty jury and he got the death penalty, I think. And now he's he's not they're not going to. And by the way, I don't know. This notion where everyone gets the death penalty and then, uh, you know, 41 years later. You know, died of natural causes. Right. So, okay, but uh, they're going to get a retrial. They they think they're going to get a retrial well, based on Scott that. Peter- yes. Did Scott Peterson requested it. Has he gotten that? Do we know or? Um, I, all I know is that there's news, and Gergos thinks. Um, he may be, you know, he may be on the mass singer next year. I don't know. That's 
That's you know, my, uh, Adam, my, my uh, brother-in-law is, uh, was a, a young teacher at University High School in San Diego. He's now a professor of Shakespearean literature in Atlanta. That's where he and my sister and five kids live. Uh, in his class, when he was a high school teacher, he had Scott Peterson and Phil Mickelson. Wow. And they were, and they were both on the golf team together. And my brother-in-law has pictures uh, of him and Scott and Phil Mickelson <laughs> playing golf together. How weird is that? He wow. might be subpoenaed. Wow. <laughs> well, they had asked they had asked Paul at one point after um, the murders and the conviction if um, Paul would, since he, you know, he was his teacher for two years, if he would write the book and they offered him good money. But Paul said, I just can't. It's just too dark. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to spend my days in San Quentin talking to Scott Peterson and, you know, with a guy who I know did it and I'm not going to do that. So he wow. did. did he know he did it based on understanding par- aspects of his personality with the evidence? Oh, I don't think so. I think he, he, he knew just from from all the evidence that we saw and the guilty verdict by the jury. You know, I don't think. I don't think he or I or anybody else I know thought, well, he might have gotten a bad rap. Everybody, um, you know, you know, the you know, you know, I think the system in that case worked. You know. Yeah. Well, we'll keep you posted. But it just uh, made me think of uh, well, you brought up Garagos, and I just spoke to him yesterday mm-hmm. about it. Sorry, he's well, been speaking, on death row since no. '05. By the way, sorry. Oh. Go ahead. Speaking of arrests. Um, protests in major cities were much calmer uh, the the last night than they had been. Many cities intensified their curfews. Authorities in New York, D.C. ordered people off the street while it was still daylight. L.A. County, it was 6 p.m. It was, I think, 4 p.m. in Beverly Hills. Some had 1 p.m. At least 9,300 people have been arrested in protests around the country. That's according to the AP. Um, L.A. has recorded 2,700 arrests then followed by New York, about 1,500. And it was funny because I, I'm sure you all saw in the news last night, people literally downtown just waiting around to be arrested. Just yeah. like what they wanted on record that they were arrested. So people were literally just kind of like, no, no, take your time. <laughs> Grab your zip ties. Yeah, I saw some of that. And then I realized that they're all being ushered on to the modified Greyhound bus and they're putting 45 people on this bus. Isn't that the worst thing we can do with the pandemic? Putting everyone on a piece of public huh. transportation confined so. that way? I thought that I thought the plan was to do everything but that. I thought the well, well, Greyhound buses have great ventilation though. <laughs> everyone knows this. <laughs> well, Adam air filters. <laughs> I think you missed part of um, Barbara Ferrer's speech about that. She says, as long as you don't drop them off at the beach, it will be fine. Uh, yes, as long as they're not sunning themselves on the beach. Yeah, I'm lo- I'm looking at all these people, and you have to think, the, the folks I saw, the ones that are waiting to be arrested, these are like housewives in yoga pants. Like, these women are just hanging out, like, go ahead and zip tie me, and I'll walk it over here. And I'm watching them do it, and many... Most of the protesters uh, have masks, but no one's wearing gloves. I don't, I'm not, a lot of the cops are wearing gloves, but many aren't. The whole glove mask thing is sort of catch as catch can with the cops. Like some of the cops have them. Some of them have them, but they wear them like a kerchief around their, around their neck. Like, it's like, I got this mask, but I just kind of wear it down around my, around my neck and and then many, none of the protesters are wearing gloves. I remember, remember all the glove talk. We all need to glove up. We need to glove. And half the cops are, their hands are all over them. I'm not saying this because I'm paranoid. I'm saying this because we were nuts for screaming at everyone to do this two weeks ago. The cops are like escorting them with their hands on them. Then they push them all into a giant bus, which is the thing we said to stay away from. And all the people that were being arrested presumably were the people who were the tip of the spear of the whole pandemic crisis two weeks ago. These were the middle-aged women who were yelling at their teenage boys, you take your shoes off, you come back in the house, you wipe down those shoes. You know, now they're all just cops, hands all over them, getting put in a bus. I guess they're done with it. Yeah, I guess they're done being scared of it. Okay. Because these are like middle-aged, woke, white women and dudes. They aren't the folks that are, you know, Daytona Beach 
you know, spring break partiers. These people were listening over the last few months. I'm I'm guessing. But anyway. Yeah. Well, Floyd Mayweather has offered to pay for George Floyd's funeral services. The family has accepted. And you think, well, that's very nice. OK, anyway, well, he does have a connection, sort of. Um, so he's going to pay for different services in Houston, Minnesota, Charlotte and another location they haven't figured out yet. And Mayweather thought it was the right thing to do after learning Anzel Jennings, the CEO of his TMT music label, grew up with George. So there is a little bit of a connection there. And he's going to he's going to take care of everything, apparently. Well, good for Floyd. I, yeah. I can't figure out if I love that guy or hate that guy, but I, I think <laughs> I like him. Yeah, I, I think this tips out. the scale a bit. Um, now, well, wait a minute. Has, yeah. John Mayer, Floyd Mayweather, good guys, douchebags. What do we, Ooh. what do we think? I've come around on John Mayer. Yeah, John Mayer, I'm not convinced is a decent guy. I am, and and I might be moving toward Floyd, as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not physically, yeah. but emotionally. Sure, don't go the arms reach. No. Yeah, Patrick, what do you think? Uh, well, it's a good move. I don't judge anybody. I just keep quiet and listen. Okay. There we go. You can have them both. So everybody's doing their part. Everybody's trying to make a difference, push toward equality and better understanding. And that includes Grindr. They, uh, and please don't make me explain Grindr to you because I know that you know, they're removing its ethnicity filter in what they say is a show of support for Black Lives Matter. This is according to CNN. So the gay dating and hookup app announced the change on Monday saying, we will continue to fight racism on Grindr, both through dialogue with our community and a zero tolerance policy for racism and hate speech on our platform. As part of this commitment and based on your feedback, we've decided to remove the ethnicity filter from our next release. Apparently, you could pay for an upgrade called X Extra Service that would let you filter in and out of various ethnicities of dudes to grind. With. Is it all, it's all gay, right? Grinder? Yes. Well, I can check. I can check if they've done that on the app, right? Here. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> I'm on a special. I'm on a special. I've got a special app. It's called Mustachio, and uh, we're smaller. Yeah. <laughs> well, is, I'll, uh, I'll 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 slide in my uh, joke, which is. Uh, by the time uh, I use one of these uh, dating apps, I'm going to go for one uh, for old folks called Carbon Dating. <laughs> it's real good. 65 and above. <laughs> Only if you're high risk for the COVID-19 virus sh should you apply to Carbon Dating. Yes. It's really good. Breaking hearts oh. and hips since uh, 2017. <laughs> So when things really started to pop off in D.C. the other day, um, news came out that Trump was whisked away to the bunker, um, presumably by the Secret Service. You know, sometimes I don't know that you you have a lot of choice when the Secret Service has a job to do. Uh, you know, I get it. And um, and they were, you know, concerned for his personal safety. Do you safety. think he can be whisked away? I <laughs> well, don't think he can. I think if he's in the middle of a story, those guys are going to have to wait. You know what I mean? Like if I'm in the middle of a story and someone tries to whisk me away, I'm like, hey, that, that, yeah. hold on. Hey, what gives? <laughs> right. Let's give me a couple more minutes here. Right. Well, he'd like to say his piece about what happened uh, as protesters were gathering outside the White House and he was reportedly taken to the bunker at the request of the Secret Service. He spoke to Fox News and wanted people to know that the reports are false. He wasn't taken anywhere. He simply happened at that moment to want to go down to the bunker and inspect it. It's a coincidence. Please stop making it something it's not. Really? He said that? He wanted to he, <laughs> get a measure of the drapes. The news were the news was false and explained that he simply went downstairs to inspect it. He wanted to inspect the bunker. Jesus, I gotta hear that. Do yeah, we have do you, it? I, I should I didn't pull it. Sorry, Chris, if you can find it. That's gonna be comical. All right, well, you can find it. Anyway, keep going. We'll find it. All right. Well, some big news out of uh USC. They're there seems like they're the first to go on record oh, yeah. that I've seen, this. Brian. Yeah. The University of Southern California will resume in-person classes for the fall semester. They just announced that face coverings will be mandatory and the schedule's a little different. Semester's going to begin on August 17th. 
that's a week earlier than originally scheduled. And um, the uh, the university transitioned to online instruction in mid-March, kind of when everybody did. All classes and final exams will be will end before Thanksgiving. And uh, the fall break will be eliminated. So they're just adjusting everything. They want everybody back in their, at their desks. Well, we're going to look like fucking retards with the close the schools down. That's a dumb fucking idea. We're fucking idiots. We should have never closed the school down. There's no kids get this shit. I had to watch my whole kid's virtual graduation last night. Oh. Just sit in the living room and watch a stupid thing with all the pictures. And every picture, because I go to a, my house is in a kind of high achievement neighborhood. And all the pictures would be the headshot of the kid. And then next to them, it'd be like their activity. They'd be playing a violin. They'd oh, be no. playing a cello. Oh, they'd no. be jumping a horse. My fucking picture of my son eating uh, Hot Pockets and playing Fortnite. Like it was holding like, a video game controller. Yeah, yeah like my kids weren't doing <laughs> Your anything. Your daughter's texting. <laughs> my... Well, Sonny was shrugging. Sitting, yeah, like, wait one for me. Like, <laughs> these other kids were like, one kid had to be 50 meters deep, you know, scuba certified, like shot of him in the Caribbean. Other Every every other kid was playing an instrument. Half of them were up on stage, you know, doing some interpretive dance. <laughs> there had been one on a horse, at least. Many on horses. Yeah. And, and riding wheelies on mountain bikes, you know. And I was just like, look at that kid. Look at that kid. Look at these kids are kicking. What the hell's going on around here? <laughs> Yeah, those kids are kicking ass. Yeah, that had to be a tough watch. Well, it was weird because it was, it was, they did it alphabetically, you know, and I got twins. So once we got past the C's, I was like, can I leave? And like, no, we have to watch the graduation, you know, and I'm like, okay, but. Yeah, if you were the Zuckercorns, you'd be oh, screwed. Yeah. I had to cheer on the kids that were coming later on that were friends with my kids. Oi. And I mean, it's just one of those things where you go, you got a decision to make. You, you get up and leave and then sort of pay the price, you know, slowly for the rest of your life. Or do you just sit here, ride out the next 32 <laughs> minutes and be glad you did. Sonny comes, Sonny, Sonny comes home. It's like, Sonny, I want to meet, I want you to meet your new best friend, Johnny Anderson. <laughs> I don't even know this kid. That's right. It'll pay off. Trust me. Right. Yeah, but you're at home, Adam, right? Can't you uh, just fill up a cocktail and then another cocktail. I, I, I said like at a certain point I did say, can I get up and go to the kitchen? Like once we pass my kids, what, are, what are we missing? So I was granted that permission. Oh, that's to nice. Get up and go to the kitchen. But we did. And then, you know, the, the teachers, by the way, I don't know when the last time you guys sat through a teacher where it's like, you know, they're sitting there and they're like, um, I, you know, it's a lot of, you know, they start talking like, when I met Rebecca, it was in the fourth grade. Her smile could light up a room. Rebecca always thought of others before she thought of herself. It reminds me of a poem that I, it's like, oh boy, can we move this shit along? Because like, I'm so fucking used to like... I want to see the Lance Armstrong documentary. I'm watching the last dance, you know, like I, everything to me is like, here we go. Like you forget, you forget how far entertainment has come along and you haven't been in school and seen a non-professional read that teleprompter, man. And, it, it, and by the way, you know, G rated right down oh. the middle, nothing edgy, nothing going at all, all the platitudes, all the stories about the kids and putting other people before them. And I, as, as a, as a teacher, I wish I had a class of 30 Rebecca Stevenson's. I, it makes coming to, for me, it makes coming to work a joy. When I see, it's like, oh boy, I, you guys forgot about all those assemblies and all that shit you had to sit through. Teachers are windy, man. They, she, it, well, she think, really lights up a room. Right. Well, think, think about the job of a teacher, which is like, if you're up on stage, like if, if you're, if you're a stand up comedian and you've been up on stage for four minutes and you're not hearing any laughter, that's a lifetime. But as a teacher, all you do is stand all day, seven hours a day in front of a group, 
get no laughter. You have no metronome. You know what I mean? Like you don't have this, I got to pace it up because everyone's bored of shit and they're not going anywhere and they're captive. So your whole fucking metronome, your entertainment metronome has been slowed down to a crawl. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, no, no, no argument. Yeah. New policy. You know, those, uh, they, they can only use words that start with the letters of your name. So if it's Gina, you know, it's like four words, generous, uh, Great. You know, right. in, uh yeah, ingenuity, nubile, right. Oh, thank right. You. Whatever. <laughs> nubile. <laughs> Going into My the teacher. eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> we have the Trump audio from the, uh, oh, good. Show. Max Pat has found it. Act. And then the reports were they were so worried they brought you downstairs in the White House to a bunker. What could you tell me Sunday night Sunday night was like for you and your family? Well, it was a false report. Uh, I wasn't down. I went down uh, during the day and I was there for a tiny little short period of time. And it was much more for an inspection. There was no problem during the day. The problem I saw Leland got uh, whacked pretty good but that was during the night and this problem these problems are during the night not during the day and i go down i've gone down uh two or three times all for inspection i'm convinced He's an inspector i'm convinced as well all right apologize but, gina you yeah i'm apology. very sorry i, He's I really got that wrong <laughs> it does inspection work sure okay that's a job yeah, absolutely. It's a job. First off, mildew is an issue in bunkers. I don't know if you guys know sure. that. but And that White House is very old. They're below the frost line, man. You got to get out there and you have to boots on the ground. You got to inspect. That's right. And, and he has to a, inspect who better one the to do that? He has a building background. That's you, right. You think. He's built a lot of subterranean parking lots there in yeah. Jersey and New York City. Nobody knows right. the subterranean world like the Trumps do. Number one, foundation and subterranean world as well. These uh, these other guys, these Secret Service guys, a bunch yeah. of yahoos who yeah. you know played football for the Air Force Academy. Right. What do they know about subterranean construction? Very Next little. to nothing. Next to nothing. Well, there you go. Well, that's how yeah. you know there was an inspection going on. Done All and right. done. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did say that everyone seems to be doing their part just to help the world move forward right now. That includes Jennifer Aniston. God bless her. She's raising money for coronavirus relief in her own way. Uh, Fox News reports that she revealed on her Instagram she's auctioning off a nude portrait of herself that was taken in 1995 at the height of Friends frenzy. It's you. You may have seen this picture before. We have it, uh, sort of crossing her legs and uh, in front of herself mm -hmm. uh, but she's definitely naked and uh can you yeah thank you um and uh a hundred percent of the proceeds according to her instagram post are going to naf clinics that's an organization which provides free coronavirus testing and care nationwide to the medically underserved you know it's a good gig you know we always think you know fashion photographers cool especially when the chicks are getting naked and stuff but the best gig is bathrobe wrangler because <laughs> the other guys, you know, he's behind the tripod. He's got a boner, but the bathrobe wrangler guy, that guy gets to see nipple and pube and ass and everything because sure. his job is just to sort of wait. Like the guy gets the tennis balls when they miss the serve, you know, his job is to be in like a three point stance with a, with, with a bathrobe, you know, and then as soon as they go, all right, we're going to break it down. He gets to go up and do the bathrobe, but he gets a fucking front row seat to all that yeah. is going on in the nudity. The hot chick actually walks toward him. Yeah. The bathtub. I'm going to yeah. tell my son, listen, boy, I don't know what you're thinking about at this point in your life, but uh, hot chick celebrity fashion shoot bathrobe wrangler. That's really uh -oh. good. Well, and then what do you have to be good at in order to do that? You have to be good at being really good at acting like you're not looking at what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's right. number one. Unprofessional. I'm yeah. going to train my boy. I'm going to be like, look, I'm going to get my underpants and I'm going to put my bathrobe on the other side of the room. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Let's start working it now. Like Todd Marinovich's dad, except for with, with uh, bathrobes. You know what I mean? Marv. You know, I'm going, you know what? I'm not, I'm getting rid of the underpants. I'm just going to go full nude because I want him to be ready. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to tell him you're going to need, 
two things. There's two qualities that, that I need to bestow upon you. You need to be really good with bathrobes. I need you to really know how to transport a bathrobe. You don't hand me that bathrobe upside down. I'm putting my fucking foot no. through the arm. No. Mm-hmm. You work on that. We're going to drill. Or drill hard on that. The other f- aspect of this game, look, I'm sorry if it's culturally offensive. You have to pass yourself off as being gay. You have to. It's not going to work if you're up there looking like Patrick Warburton talking about uh, nailing some hot trim the night before. It's not going to. No. You need to be gay. You can pass yourself off as gay, and you really need to handle the terry cloth. Okay. I like your idea of simulating the game situation by being nude. Like if a team knows they're going on the road, like where it's going to rain or whatever, they'll turn the sprinklers on. They use the wet footballs. They use the pipe in noise, you know, sometimes. It it is exactly analogous. There's no difference. It's spot on. You're exact. You're saying exactly what I'm saying. It's not even an analogy. It's what I'm doing. Pretty much just that. Yeah, that's right. We're going to, but we are going to simulate conditions. There's beach shoots. Yeah. You know, that sand, that sand is very different from a footing standpoint than Jennifer Aniston's shoot. That's inside. Go get the graham crackers from the kitchen. Crumble them up. That's right. We're going to be outside like the uh, SI photo shoot. You know, they go topless all the time. They paint on. the You're going to have to work that. We're going to have conditions. I'm going to turn a fan on. There's offshore breezes. I'm going to put some sand down. (laughs) You know, I want that kid to be prepared. And, and, And when it comes time... You know, when uh, when the call is given out, I want him to answer that call. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Be ready to answer that call, yeah. Bathrobe wrangler. You know what I might do? I might even do a version of the bathrobe with like a batting donut on a baseball. I may add weight to it. I may take like a batting donut and tie it around the sash. You know what I mean? To add I, thought some ex- say, I thought you were going to say like a bigger girl model. <laughs> No, well that too, but I'm gonna I'm gonna add weight to the bathrobe because I you know what I'm gonna tell him I'm tell him he's gonna he's gonna beg me he's gonna be dad no more weight on the back I go you know what you're gonna thank me when you get down to a regulation robe it's gonna feel like nothing any idiot can carry a normal bathrobe (laughs) that's right that's right I'm gonna get on this immediately Patrick how old are your kids can I you want me to train them yeah well yeah. Oh, I work with them already a little bit, but I would love it uh, if I could uh, get you to work with them a little bit. Sometimes, you know, they just don't want to listen to dad. But Talon's 27. He's like six foot five. Oh, well, that's what I'm doing. 204. All he's right. A monster. How, how's this gay Flex. game? How's this gay game? Uh, needs work. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's what I'm here for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's got to integrate uh, the description fabulous and a little bit more of what he yeah. describes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then there's Lexi, and she's uh, 26. And Girl, then uh, no. Shane, yeah. 22. Now, Shane, 20, Shane, male? Sorry. Yes. Shane, yes. Gabriel's name. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> I can, I'll can. i teach one of the boys long snapping, and then the other boy I'll, I'll teach the bathrobe hustler. They can flip that. a coin for it. Yeah, so ask them. Maybe the 6'5 guy wants to do the long snapping. There's a good gamut there. Yeah. Well, he has a 19 year old. It might not be too late for him for bathroom bangling. I will do both. We'll, we'll, we'll do both. You know what? We'll try him out at both. We'll see, see what, what the fit is. You know, I don't want to force. Where's passion him. lies. Yeah. Where's passion lies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go uh, ahead. I'll watch, watch uh, as well um, while you're working. With them. Oh, that's, that's a gift. And Patrick, please. Yes. You're embarrassing yourself. <laughs> Well, let's talk about another kid that uh, seems like he could have been on the um, graduation with Sonny and Natalia. 13-year-old boy graduated from City College in Southern California with his one, two, three, fourth associate's degree, making him the youngest graduate in the school's history. Little Jack Rico of La Mirada, California. He graduated from Fullerton College. Rico started taking classes at the school when he was 11. He spent the last two years earning four different degrees. Uh, With most schools closed during the pandemic, Rico's family's holding a special drive-by celebration for him. And he plans to continue his education in the fall at the University of Nevada, where he's been given a full scholarship. So uh, little dude Doogie there will be 14 and going to the University of Nevada. Yeah. Uh, He's the exact same. Sorry, wait, you broke up, Patrick. What'd you say? Uh, He's the exact opposite of me. Mm -hmm. Uh Yeah. Now, look, maybe 
Maybe things work for him academically. Maybe they don't. Maybe the way the robe is not in his future, but maybe it is. I'm not, I'm not telling him what direction to go, but I'm saying I can teach him how to hustle that robe. Yeah. That's all. All right, let's bring it home, uh, Gina Grad. <laughs> you got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Let me hit JB Weld here. DIY projects. You want to get through those DIY projects. You want to save money. You want to avoid paying a repairman. Big or small repairs, home or a garage. Ordinary household glue. Well, it's ordinary. It has the word ordinary. If you need it to be strong, you need ordinary. A better choice. And that's J.B. Weld. J.B. Weld, they're a great sponsor. Um, I've known these guys for a lot of years. I know the owner personally. And I hung out uh, with them at um, SEMA, actually, a couple years ago. And I got to talking to them. And I said, uh, I use your product all the time. So why don't you come on board? And they said, fine. J.B. Weld, man. I keep that in your toolbox, your kitchen drawer, craft room, metal, wood, plastic, or more. Don't glue it. J.B. Weld it. Available at J.B. Weld. Dot com, Home Depot, Lowe's, AutoZone, Advanced Auto Parts, O'Reilly, Walmart, Amazon, Michaels, and more. It is J.B. Weld. All right, let's see. Me <clears throat> doing a live uh, Q&A, Adam Kroll on Mass. That's uh, this Monday, June 8th at 12 p.m. Central. So uh, RSVP at uh, adamunmass.com. And uh, book's coming out. Pre-order it. I'm your emotional support animal. That's uh, coming out on the 16th. Couple uh, Nashville Zanies, June uh, 12th and 13th, doing some stand-up and some live pod there. So get some tickets and come say hi. Patrick Warburton, Inheritance. Name of the movie, available on Amazon, iTunes, and On Demand. And also uh, Space Force, available, as we know, on Netflix as well. Do we cover it, uh, Patrick? You good? All good. Thanks, Adam. You're awesome. Thanks, man. Love, Love talking to you. We'll talk soon. And uh, check out my stand-up on the YouTube page. Until next time, Adam Kroll for Patrick Warburton and Billy and Gina and Bald saying, oh, Christy saying, mahalo. <laughs> <laughs>